So, <clears throat> so here we are, we're still trudging along through Core Connects Rhode Island on Zoom. And uh, the goal of Core Connects Rhode Island was to connect Jewish women with each other in the state of Rhode Island. So we're doing that. We have, um, we have women in South County, Narragansett and Warwick Neck and the East Side and Pawtucket. And um, I think that's what I know. So that's pretty good. And uh, please God, we'll be able to meet in person soon. Um, and uh, Passover, the season of our freedom, the season of spring. And I asked four lovely ladies who are here tonight to share with us some of their thoughts about this season and how they approach Passover. And we had a little chit chat before we start the, the meeting and uh, probably it's asking our speakers to think, help us get into the mode of thinking about Passover and what we can bring to our own consciousness and what we can think about at this time. And if we're, if we're in a Seder, what kinds of thinking we could have at the Seder or bring to the Seder if we celebrate that. And um, so I, the, the order of our speakers tonight is uh, Naomi has, got, has asked to go first because she has um, some children running around in the back that might need her attention. So we're gonna go with Naomi Bain first, uh, followed by Rashmi and Aliza and then Elisheva. So no particular order, only name we asked to go first. And um, so I'm going to introduce each speaker and then if they could, they'll sort of give their, their thoughts. And then if we'd like to come together at the end and share some of our own thoughts or ask questions or whatever it is we'd like to do, that we could do that. So that's how it's gonna play out. So Naomi Bain is co-founder of Mitzvah Matzahs, a nonprofit matzah factory that sends all profits to fight human trafficking. She is a school-based speech language pathologist. Her greatest joy is to be a parent to her two little children and being a partner to Barry Dollinger. She likes to talk fast, but live slow, quote unquote, dabbles in design. And um, Naomi, a, a nice design behind you. Um, that, uh, Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to hand the mic over to you. Thanks so much for inviting me to speak, Alyssa. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so tonight I wanted to kind of frame Pesach, our holiday about freedom, um, in regards to modern day freedom and slavery. It's a big focus of what we do at Mitzvah Matzahs. Um, all of our proceeds go to fight human trafficking. So we obviously feel that human trafficking is a modern form of slavery. Um, so I want to delve into what that is a little bit and then kind of take a look at how our lives, which seem to be pretty removed from that, maybe aren't so removed and what we can kind of take away and glean from the reality of modern slavery for our everyday lives. Um, so first of all, human trafficking is this huge problem. It affects 40 million people worldwide, 400,000 people in the United States. Um, there were, 14 reported cases of trafficking in Rhode Island last year, but you can imagine that that number is much bigger because when somebody is a survivor of trafficking and dealing with it day in, day out, they're really afraid for their lives. And so they're not going to report their situation or they're afraid that somebody they care about will be hurt. Um, and so trafficking is a situation in which somebody by means of either a ruse or some other coercive act somehow ends up in a situation where somebody is controlling their choices. And this is a, the very, you know, kind of basic tenet of freedom, right? If you can't choose how to live your life, you're not a free person. Um, but when somebody's in a situation of trafficking, um, usually what's going on is coercion from violence or threats to loved ones. Um, and there's also a lot of control going on. So people who are trafficked won't have independence because things they depend on for independence, like identifying documents might have been confiscated from them. So if you're traveling abroad and someone took away your passport, that's going to be a very difficult situation to get out of, especially if that person is now telling you to do something at the threat of violence or other such things. Um, so in a nutshell, that's kind of how people end up in a traffic situation and what they might be facing. And people who are trafficked might be asked to do anything ranging from sex work to labor. Um, and I think a lot of people maybe aren't as aware of the labor trafficking that goes on, which is maybe what touches more closely 
to our lives. Um, so in our country, there are actually a variety of areas in which labor trafficking goes on, but the thing I kind of want to focus on tonight is what goes on abroad. Um, some of the biggest industries for labor trafficking are tropical fruits, sugar, cocoa, coffee. Cotton is a huge problem with Uyghur slave labor going on in China. Um, the, the cotton production as well as the you know, turning the cotton plant into material for fabrics, um, for clothing and other items. Um, toy production is a big problem with slave labor, sporting goods. Um, so when you stop to think about it, you're probably using items that are made with trafficked labor every day. Oh, another one I forgot to mention is um, technology uses a lot of um, components that are gotten through slave labor, like the mica, um, which is a mineral used in a lot of technology, also in cosmetics. Um, so really everything we're using day in, day out, you know, everyone gets up in the morning and uses some sort of cosmetic, takes out their cell phone, looks at their laptop. And so on some level, you might start to think, well, what can I do about this? Like, this is beyond me, right? And our Haggadah also kind of blames the Egyptians for enslaving the Jews to bring this back to Pesach. But let's take a moment and think about that. Does that actually make sense? Like, do you feel responsible? Like show of hands, who here feels responsible that they did something to put this slave action into being? Right, like this has, well, interesting, I see one hand. So I don't think that I made any choices in my life that, you know, encouraged this economy in the first place, but do I make choices every day that allow it to continue? Unfortunately, that's a problem, right? So um, I need to, I'm gonna ask you to hold on one second, okay? Can you go back to Abba for a minute? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, um, so sorry, we're uh, talking about this trafficking abroad and how our everyday economy and lifestyle choices contribute to it. Um, so, I guess one thing we take away from the Seder is that the Egyptians were kind of responsible for enslaving the Jews, even the average Egyptian that didn't make that decision at the top because they benefited from the economy. And we absolutely benefit from that economy, right? We wouldn't be able to have the lifestyle we have with the comforts we have if things weren't as affordable as they were, which they wouldn't be if everyone was paid a fair, a fair wage and given safe working conditions and reasonable working hours and such. So what can you do? That's kind of, I think, what a lot of people would like to share at their Seder, some takeaway that is maybe a little uplifting. Um, so if it's okay to open for thoughts, does anyone have a thought on that matter? If not, that's okay. The, 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 repeat the question again, Naomi. Does anyone have thoughts on what we might do to help the little bit of, you know, the little bit of space that we have to make choices about our economic contributions to modern slavery. Um, anyone have thoughts about things we can do? Yeah, Margaret? I think investigating where you're getting things from. I learned a lot about the chocolate industry. I actually did something at Emanuel years ago and mm -hmm. I did, there are Jews involved in some of the chocolate trade and industry back in the day and maybe still, but um, so looking into those things of so excellent. where so things thing, come from. Yeah, so one thing you can do is try and research where things come from. So for products like chocolate, sugar, coffee, vanilla, um, there are fair trade certifications. So that's a good indicator that there are independent agencies going out to check on the working conditions, um, the entire supply chain of that product. And if it's labeled fair trade, then you know that it was not produced with slave labor. So that is absolutely something you can do. Um, any other thoughts? Yes, Betsy? I don't know, this might be a little off course, but it seems relevant. So I moved here from the San Francisco area and, and half my work as a psychologist was with, was in community hospitals and trauma 
and because I lived in Spain and spoke Spanish, I decided to dedicate half my work to working with those populations. So I had this like kind of inbred guilt quietly all the time because there was so much suffering and it would make me think of the suffering of my own ancestors and here was modern day. So it was really difficult because a lot of them were people who worked in the fields in California, worked in dress shops, worked in, they were horrible conditions and I found it really frustrating. And so to me, a lot of the work was, I didn't, you can be an advocate, but not really. I mean, I tried to be for them, but that was really the point of their coming in the first place was to deal with what was going on. So it was kind of a, I think it was a lot. Right? Because it's, it's, uh, it was really hard to, how do you reconcile that? Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that experience. Um, yeah. So I just want to point out that the experiences that survivors go through, um, it's always important to realize that even when survivors maybe do something illegal or whatever, this is not their choice. Um, so it's important to stand by them as people. Um, and then a few other things I would like to put out there. Um, one thing is just like, you know, we recycle plastic goods and things like that. There's no reason we can't recycle things that are reusable at the end of our personal uses with them, which would diminish the economic demand for cheap throwaway items. Um, the less of a disposable economy we have for things like clothing, housewares, et cetera, uh, sporting goods, et cetera, right? If you can get a used bike instead of a new bike or whatever that's in good condition, great, do it. Um, Another thing that I would like to put out there is there's an app um, called Sweat and Toil. Um, and I will put that in the chat. Um, it's by iLab. It's actually from the US Department of Labor. And they have um, looked into where goods come from, from A to Z. And you can look through it alphabetically. Um, you can type in the type of item you're trying to purchase. And it will then let you know, um, based on country of origin, if there are problems with forced labor, child labor, um, or both. Um, forced labor being roughly equivalent to trafficking. Um, so that's a great tool that you can actually take with you day to day when you're shopping, when you're thinking, oh, I really do need a new dress, or I want to buy, I don't know, a papaya, and where did this come from, and how do I know? Um, so that's a great takeaway. Um, and I'll leave no, you. I'm, I'm, I hate to do this because this conversation could continue through the whole hour. No, that's it. Um, that's but where I, I'll I, leave you. I need to. Uh, I need to move it along. But I, I think what's what's so interesting is the way that you've brought, you know, our seder and our experience of being slaves in Egypt and made it very current. Like what's happening in our world today and what as we can do to um, be less of the Egypt kind of oppressor. That's that's continuing things that should it be should that we should learn have learned from. So you're teaching us how to learn how to put that lesson into practice today. So thank you, thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Um, we'll maybe stay on. We'll see what happens at the end if you can. Um, I'm going to uh, invite um, Rashmi. Rashmi um, didn't send me a little bio, so I'm going to make it up. <laughs> um, Rashmi, um, and I, I got to know Rashmi quite well when we took a trip to Israel together a number of years ago. Um, she is a urologist and uh, she is well known in the Jewish community um, all over, all over town, I think, or certainly all over Providence. And uh, she is most beloved by all who know her. She is a wife and a mother of three lovely emerging adult children. Um, even if they're not emerging, even if they're not adult, they are emerging as adults. And uh, she's such a love. And uh, Rashmi, you're up. That's it. <laughs> That's your introduction. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. So um, I know I didn't send Alyssa a, a bio. I was like, you know me. You can, you'll figure it out. <laughs> you can make something up. So, but um, thank you, Alyssa, for inviting me. This is wonderful. And Naomi, the thank you so much. You're a very hard act to follow. And thank you to my fellow speakers. Obviously, we're so crazy and busy, but I always. I'm impressed when we can all get together like this. And thank you for all coming today. Um, and, you know, again, sort of like on a totally different note, I sort of took this and I, I thought about when Alyssa texted me and we talked on the phone briefly, like about freedom. And I, I sort of 
went totally in a different direction and sort of thought about like personal freedom um, when it comes to Passover. And obviously freedom is essential to the story of Passover, free from the Egyptians, free from the oppression, and eventually free to go to Israel. And then with this newfound freedom and its responsibilities, Jews then receive the Torah on Mount Sinai. And this is celebrated in our holiday of Shavuot, uh, seven weeks away, where um, we then have to take this freedom and sort of find a way to harness it. Um, many feel that Passover is a celebration of freedom from oppression and Shavuot is a celebration of the obligations that we freely accept upon ourselves with God's guidance. Uh, at this time of year, we can look at what we require to be free from in order to be, in order to be free to, to find our own potential and improve uh, the world around us. So thank God, I mean, I, obviously Naomi's talk and we're so lucky to have the lives that we have. And I feel every day I try to remind myself how blessed I am, mostly because my children still like me and they don't necessarily hate me, although that changes every day. Um, but there are things that I think about when speaking of freedom and as a woman and as a, someone who's a urologist or, or, or someone who in the workforce as well as as a mom and as a partner. Um, one of the best, best pieces of advice that I ever received was from a friend. Um, I'll say thanks to Deb Skolnick Einhorn for this piece of advice. And it was the freedom to say no. Um, and obviously when Alyssa first called me, I was ready to say no, because I've gotten pretty good at saying no, but it's really hard to say no to Alyssa, um, as you all know. And I would just encourage you always to say yes to Alyssa. She'll thank me for that um, at a later date, I'm sure. Um, and whether it's at work, a family or socially, um, I think it's important to not be afraid to say it. And I think, you know, we're raised, you're a mom, you're used to saying yes, you're, you're in a workforce where you have to always be the yes person. And definitely in the field of medicine, as a medical student, you're used to saying, yes, I'm happy to clean that up. Yes, I'm happy to go draw that blood. Yes, I'm happy to spend extra time to help you do that presentation. And as a resident, even more so. And I think growing up in this sort of society of being, you know, type A, which I totally am, personality. We're very used to saying yes to any commitment that's given our way. Um, and I, I think it's, it was a very important lesson for me because I think that guilt, like we all have, you know, I'm a convert, but I still have a lot of Jewish guilt. So I think that guilt of saying no um, is, is always around us. And so I think obviously you don't want to say no all the time and you want to try to contribute and be helpful and volunteer. But I think when your cup is full and you realize that you're sort of burning things at both ends, it's okay to just say no. So um, in terms of other parts of it, I think um, it's also really empowering to truly say yes to what I could do and no to what I couldn't do. And I think you can also learn to like rephrase that. So instead of just saying, no, I can't be on your board, you can say, you know, I'd love to be on it in the future, but I have an eight and a half year old that really thinks she never sees me and needs me more. So I have to say yes to her. And I, I'm sorry that I have to say no to you. So I think that those are all important lessons. And I think until someone sort of gave me that ability to say that, um, I think it was, it was something that was really important for me to learn. And the other second best piece of advice I ever got was from my sister-in-law. And, and she told me to ask for what you want. And I think, again, you know, we are so used to trying to please everybody else that we're so also afraid in the workforce or socially or with our partners to sort of ask for what we want. And I think it's important as women to sort of remember that. And it's that freedom to sort of ask for what you want. Um, when I started in practice, I was uh, newly married and I started my practice and I was like, hi, I'm pregnant three months. And, and after I had my first child, I really realized that I wanted to go back like only four days a week. And, and, you know, in a bunch of, I literally was the first adult female urologist in the state of Rhode Island. And I was the first female partner in my huge group of men. And literally in 50 years, I don't think any guy has ever worked part-time unless it was for a health issue or they were literally 75 and about to retire like the next day. So I remember asking my partners and being like, I told my sister-in-law, there's no way I'm a urologist. Like, I can't, like nobody, like you're a surgeon, nobody's ever gonna let you work part-time. Like it's not, it doesn't happen. And she was like, you have to ask, like what's the worst they can say is no. And I did, I asked, they said, sure, you're gonna get a 20% pay cut, but they said yes. And I just remember feeling this huge, like thinking like, God, I was so afraid to ask for what I wanted. And I think a lot of times we're afraid to ask that. And I think that like when we're sitting at that Passover Seder or when we're, when we're with our families, like I think it's okay to sort of ask for what you want. And I think, you know, you obviously don't want to hurt someone's feelings. You want to take care of all those around you. But those were 
really important pieces of advice. And then I guess um, the little other little last thing, and as I was sort of talking to Alyssa and every night that I come home from work and, you know, if you're, I'm sure all of us are very busy for those that work or at home, like there's some people that are primarily working and checking their email all day. And depending on your job, like I literally am running around if I'm seeing patients or in the operating room, I never even get a chance to look at my phone. Then I get home and of course I have 50 emails that I haven't responded to and my kids are there. And I think the other thing that Shabbat has really taught me and, and part of this was going on the trip to Israel and really sort of being intentional about certain things that we do so that freedom to sort of let go of other things. And even regardless of what you do on Shabbat, um, and I think this was such a nice piece of advice, was like, even if it means two hours on Shabbat, or if it's the whole Shabbat, or if it's 10 hours on Shabbat, like put your phone away, be intentional when you light the Shabbat candles, think of your each child, how can you be a better parent to each child? How can you be a better partner? How can you be a better friend um, or a better daughter or a better mother? Like all those things, I think, um, to be intentional and having that freedom away from your devices. Um, and for me, Shabbat is really special because I think like if I ever ask my kids to put away their iPads, it never happens. Like literally I'm like half an hour. I'm like, okay, I, I told you to put your iPad away half an hour ago. I said, you could watch one show. Now it's two shows. And it's amazing on Shabbat, like when in my family, like if I say, oh, Shabbat started, literally they turn it off, they put it away. It's not even a question. And so I think all those things just in terms of family and in terms of myself more than anyone, um, I think when I think of Passover, I think of family and I think of all those intentional things. So for me, I think the other important thing on this Passover is try to be intentional about your devices. Like if you're sitting at the Seder, say, oh, I'm going to put this phone away. I'm not even going to have it near me. Um, and so I think all of those are important things to think about. Wow, there's a, there's a lot of stuff there, Rashmi. We have to write it up and send it out. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. Freedom to I say had a lot no. of thoughts about freedom. And I, <laughs> yeah. I think I was sort of more focusing on personal freedom because, yeah. and which is so nice because I think it's important to be serious too. And like, not only about ourselves, because in the broader scheme of things, I think you really realize after Naomi's speech, how blessed and lucky I think pretty much everyone on this is obviously, you know, there, everyone has their own personal struggles, but it's, we're very, very blessed. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you for um, giving us some, um, some tips of how to, how to how to live more intentionally and mindfully and the way we want to live our lives. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Aliza Krieger, my friend Aliza. Um, uh, so actually, I think I met Aliza when she was a student at URI. Did, you did undergraduate at URI, right? Right. Um, and she also then continued on and, and did um, PhD in uh, clinical psychology also at URI and completed her pre-doctoral internship at Bedford uh, VA in psychosocial rehabilitation. She divides her time between her private practice and her role as a clinical psychologist, behavioral consultant. In that role, she enjoys helping individuals navigate mental health and behavioral issues. She is uh, blessed, I, I added that, to have a wonderful husband and two, two children, Two lovely daughters um, who challenge her perspective on behavioral management. And um, she is a dear friend of mine. I've known her for a long time. So, Elisa, you're up. Thank you. Um, and thank you, uh, Sayomi. I think actually, who her and her husband actually um, have made me think about freedom um, uh, in terms of starting to raise funds for slave trade um, and, and making me more sensitive to the issue around that over the last couple of years. And so, I've always appreciated that because I kind of go into Pesach with that, those thoughts over the last couple of years. Um, and with Rashmi, actually, I know we've had some of these conversations even recently about um, empowering us as women to um, make healthy choices and set good boundaries for ourselves. Um, when I thought about freedom, I had just had a lot of thoughts and then no thoughts and then kind of, um, so I, I took your questions, Alyssa, and tried to kind of use that as my guide. Um, and so the first question was uh, freedom, what does that mean to me? Um, so it, to me, it means that having the ability to make choices and express myself while still feeling safe emotionally and physically. Uh, there are a lot of different ways we think about the restrictions that are placed on us and how these restrictions inhibit our freedom, including expectations from others, demands or threats from family and community, coworkers, um, different cultures and countries that uh, surround us. Um, so being in a place uh, without these restrictions feels free. Um, 
And in talking about what true freedom is, many people think that true freedom is to be able to do and say and be however one wants to be whenever and however you want to be. Um, this is something that I don't agree with. Um, and I think that Judaism doesn't agree with this. Uh, when we think about um, ourselves um, in Egypt as slaves and then being taken out, we were taken out and our freedom was not to do and be whatever we want, right? We were taken out um, and we went through the desert with many rules. Um, and these rules were there to help us develop a relationship with God, help us develop a relationship with ourselves and help us develop a relationship with other people. And I think that that's so important to understanding freedom, that it really is a balance um, in terms of an interaction between what we need, want, and do with how we impact those around us. Um, when uh, in thinking about how this has played out in my life, it made me think of um, a, an experience I had in um, some of my clinical work. I work during the day with people who have intellectual disabilities. And so I was working with um, a, an adult uh, man who was living with his father, a pretty young man. Um, and I had been, um, he'd been living with his father and he liked to take walks late at night. So he would leave the house, say 10 or 11 o'clock at night um, and he would disappear. He wouldn't let his father know that he was going out. He wouldn't let his father know where he was going or when he was coming back. And when I got invited into this um, in, uh, conflict, um, his father was very angry about the situation. And so his father would say, you need to come back at a, a reasonable hour. You need to let me know that you're coming back. And this individual kept saying, I don't need to let you know I'm an adult and I can do whatever I want, whenever I want it. And no one's gonna tell me what to do. Um, and so it was really interesting to kind of walk into this experience where the dad was like, he's never gonna listen to anybody. And so when he and I sat down, we really talked about um, what it means to be an adult with freedom. Um, and how living with other people doesn't mean you get to do whatever you want, whatever you want, even if you're a grown adult without a guardian or with a guardian, it doesn't matter, right? That living with other people um, it, it brings in a relationship that we have to have. And so part of that is appreciating and understand the level of respect um, and safety and care we have for each other. And in doing that, we let people know where we are, right? Because otherwise, um, the other partner or parent or child worries about where we are and wh what's going on. Um, and if something were to happen, how would they know how to protect us? Um, and so helping him reframe that rules around when you come back aren't about a parent, pa a father parenting a child, but are about understanding relationships and caring about each other um, and a social contract really helped him shift from fighting that to being able to understand why going out late at night by yourself without letting people know um, is maybe not the best choice. Uh, and it's interesting, once we we're able to shift into that conversation, he could have started to understand that freedom brought in responsibility. And I always kind of bring that story with me wherever I'm going, um, because sometimes we don't always have these conversations about what these what freedom means and what obligations come with it. Another um, uh, thing that had happened to me more recently um, that really brought up this idea of freedom and how freedom um, impacts my life that I don't always appreciate uh, is happened at work. I recently, um, let me just find this. I recently at work had come across um, a I had brought up a concern about uh, activities being run on Saturday as being potentially exclusive of those who keep the Sabbath. And thinking that, right, we're in a place where we can express this. Um, this is being pushed as like uh, people being included and trying to include a, a wide range of diverse um, people. And so when I brought it up, I got back uh, an experience that was a little bit surprising, um, it, what some people might call as a microaggression. Um, and then in future emails, kind of going back and forth, uh, some of these aggressions got worse. And uh, I was trying to decide um, how to address it. And I was able to um, speak to my supervisors. And I have to say, I was going into a meeting with supervisors thinking, um, 
what's going to happen? Like, is this going to impact my job? You know, is this something, will I have to quit? Uh, and it was an interesting thing to kind of ready myself with that kind of those thoughts. And I was actually received very well. I was able to eventually engage in a, a very um, good conversation with the individual writing the emails um, in a place where we are both able, where she was able to um, have a conversation about where I was coming from um, and then think about how to address this moving forward. And the reason why I was felt this um, conversation felt so poignant for this conversation for this um, talk today was because many years ago, before I was alive, but not that much longer before then, individuals couldn't didn't have the opportunity to work jobs and not work on Saturday. Uh, they some people had to quit set, quit their job at the end of the week if they wanted to take Saturday off. And so now here I am bringing up that, you know, there's a 5K on a Saturday that potentially can leave out somebody who is a religious Jew, um, getting back a, a, an aggressive response, but then being able to engage that person without um, being fearful of my job, without uh, losing it. And not only, you know, not getting any reprimand back, but being invited to continue to be a part of these conversations and to be empowered. I actually had my supervisor then say, thank you so much for bringing these up. I hope you will continue to bring these up. Um, and I just like, in a way, although the, the whole experience was not pleasant, um, I really was savoring kind of what, what was happening, right? There's something really powerful and incredible that happened um, in a place where I wasn't working for a Jewish organization, but that we could have a conversation and grow and learn from that with people who are very different than from me. Um, and I just felt um, that that really helps me really appreciate, you know, the level of freedom that we're being given um, in this country at this point. Um, so that was kind of my uh, main thing. Um, and then I think there were just some other questions in terms of thinking about, um, you know, how I bring in Passover. And I think I have to say like, for, because I because I'm not always so good at saying no, and I had agreed to have this you know to to present today. It really did make me think about Pesach um, at a very personal level, and really talk. And we actually had lots of conversations with my family, um, both my mom and my kids and my husband, um, to help kind of really think about how how freedom plays out in each of our lives. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I mean, thank you for agreeing to present and then thank you for doing the homework Remember, you're only supposed to say yes to Alyssa <laughs> I'm not good at yeah. saying no ever so <laughs> no but uh but you know the 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 journey that you went from we are now benefiting from right so all that conversation and all that condensing down into a presentation of 10 minutes that we get to benefit from and we can digest and we can think how that plays out in our lives that's yeah. the whole point so thank you thank you for that um, Eli Sheva Stark, you're the you're the uh, you're coming up the rear, and um, so Eli Sheva, I've literally probably known you most of your life. Um, <laughs> so so Eli Sheva's daughter and my daughter are peers. Um, Eli Sheva lives in Pawtucket with her husband, her little baby son, and two dogs. Uh, she teaches fourth grade at Central Falls Public School. She is an avid gardener and uh, loves to see Pesach as the Chag Haviv, the, 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 the holiday of the spring. And um, I'm, 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 you said that you enjoy bringing your produce to the Seder table, including your homegrown horseradish and your spring green. So I hope they're coming out of the ground, ready, ready to be used soon. And uh, Elisheva, you're, you're up. All right. Thank Love you. to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, yeah, so first, I also just want to echo kind of what everyone else said that I feel like Pesach is such a um, holiday that requires so much physical preparation that I, I do find nowadays that I don't really have a chance to like sit down and think about this more spiritual side of Pesach until I'm literally at the Seder. Um, so I also was going to say no, because I was like one more thing on my plate, but then I stopped and I was like, you know what, this is actually going to be a really nice opportunity to like take a step back and think about this. Cause I, I always say, I was like, oh, I wish I like had done more thinking or learning or whatever about the Seder before I get there. And so I have to say, I really appreciated this opportunity. Um, 
And I also appreciated hearing, it's kind of nice going last because I got to hear what everyone else said and I, um, just the like different directions that people took this one question. Um, so I am gonna take it in a slightly different direction. And I think I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit less about what freedom is. And I, I, I guess though, as I'm thinking about what I'm gonna say, I did have an idea in my mind of what freedom, what freedom is, but I didn't very specifically name it. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, more like who, who it's for and who I would like the freedom to be for. Um, I did write it down so it might sound a little scripted because otherwise my brain, I can't be organized like that. So. Um, all right, so as Alyssa just said, I do, I have one child. He is um, my son. He is 11 months old, so parenthood is relatively new to me, um, and as I know many have experienced before me, becoming a parent has changed how I see and experience so many things in the world, and a few weeks ago, um, I was reading something fairly depressing in the news. I don't remember what it was, but it could have been a number of things these days, unfortunately. Um, but I was I was suddenly um, overwhelmed with this thought of what the world might look like for my son and for his children and so on. Um, and for really the first time, I'd say like in my life, I experienced with such clarity the idea of um, caring about and almost fearing for the next generation and the generation after. Um, and I found myself thinking that I want him obviously like so badly to be happy and healthy and safe and for his children to be healthy and safe and their children to have the same and so on. And suddenly I was feeling, I had these like strong feelings for multiple generations that don't even exist yet. And most of whom I will never meet. Um, and because I want the best for him, I also want the best for his children and their children and so on. And I was a little like over, I, I was, I was like overwhelmed with this sudden feeling that I was having. Um, and the, the concept of like, I remember talking to my husband, Adam at the time, and I was like, this, the Jewish concept of like door to door from generation to generation suddenly became so real for me for the first time. Um, and I think I had never um, fully understood before that burning desire for things to be okay for future generations and that, that desire for the next generation. Um, okay, so first that, now to bring in um, what this has to do with freedom and Pesach. Um, I was looking through the Haggadah and at the beginning of Magid, when the storytelling portion of the Haggadah really begins, um, it starts with an expression of gratitude. And it says, quote, had the Holy One not taken our ancestors out of Egypt, then we, our children and our children's children would have remained enslaved to Pharaoh in Egypt, end quote. Um, so that kind of, to me, that was like, we're not just celebrating the redemption and freedom of one generation of people, the people who actually left Egypt, um, but we're celebrating the fact that generation after ge generation were born into freedom and not slavery because of that one act. Um, and then to take this one step further, it wasn't even the generation that physically left Egypt that was able to experience um, what you might say was the ultimate freedom, was, which was being a completely free nation in their own land. It wasn't until the original generation who left Egypt completely died out did the people of Israel actually enter the land of Israel. Um, so when you might say that they weren't totally a free people until they had that for themselves. So traditionally, this is explained um, as a punishment for that generation for worshiping the golden calf, but I kind of want to see it as a little bit more than that. Um, and I feel like it shows how far parents and a whole nation might be willing to go and how much they'll sacrifice so that their children and the next generations will have a better future. They wandered in a desert for 40 years so that their children could enter the land of Israel and experience that freedom and autonomy that they wouldn't even be able to have. Um, so again, the question that Alyssa posed was, what does freedom mean to you? And I think when she said that, 
um, the first thing that popped into my head was not so much as what is freedom, but who will it be for? Um, freedom means so many things to me. And we just heard a million different, like in so many different directions of personal freedom and freedom in society and um, yeah, so much freedom in the workplace, right? All these great examples of like, what is freedom? Um, and, and I do, I feel like there are so many, I guess I was thinking more like bigger scheme uh, freedom and threats to freedom right now as Jews and citizens of the world. Freedom means so many things to me. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. Democracy is very, very much being threatened in our own country and around the world. Climate change is threatening the health and safety of our entire planet and every person on it. Um, but I feel that now as a parent, I'm, I feel a little bit more aware of these threats to our freedom as not just here and now, but that they impact every generation to come. Um, so I kind of want to end on a, a little bit of a note of hope and maybe action that I think freedom, whatever it means to you, is worth fighting for and trying to achieve. Um, and even if we don't personally get to experience it 100%, and kind of like what Elisa was saying, I guess, that like the past generation um, experienced that anti-Semitism so much more harshly than maybe. So Elisa experienced, if you don't mind me bringing this in now, but those like microaggressions, which are real, right? And a form of anti-Semitism and that, and you're fighting for it, right? In a, in a way, so that hopefully the next generation will feel even less. Um, so yeah, I guess the idea of even if we don't personally experience these freedoms 100%, then whatever we can do so that our children and the next generation will. Um, yeah. Yeah, those are my thoughts. Yeah, good thoughts. Thank you, Alishava. Thank you. Like, it's so interesting, isn't it? You get four women to speak about what does freedom mean to you? And everybody has <laughs> a uh, a different a different um, line of thinking and how they want to how they want to pose it. So, Jess, do you have your hand up? Or are you just waving? You have to unmute yourself. Okay, everybody's. I was, clap I was clapping. All right, you have a question? <laughs> no, I was just clapping. <laughs> okay, good. Does um so I'm I'm going to call on Rachel Levy in a minute, but I wonder if anybody um would like to make a comment or to um, ask any of the presenters um, a question or reflect on the thought of something that resonated with you or how you, um, anything particular that you might like to say as we gather together to just process some of what we've just heard. Brave women. Okay. Um, I have a yes, comment. Jill. Yay, thank you. Just, um, just thinking about. I think one thing that everyone said was somehow how we're we're sandwich generation. We're we're always recipients to freedom and still in the process of, uh, you know, receiving, attaining, really fulfilling that freedom, and and trying to uh, pass it forward to move it to move it as much as we can for I love the the future generations you know how important it is to be thinking how, how incumbent and 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 the urgency to even as you know in, in as as slaves as as not being free and and wanting uh with that urgency to to see our children and children's children have have attain fulfill it fulfill the promise even more. So just the, this, that everyone said, you know, we, we have, we're, we're blessed, we have some of it uh, and we're grateful for that. And how can we yet move it forward in a, in a really meaningful way? That's very mm -hmm. touching, I think for everyone. I mean, appreciate hearing everyone's, everyone's different versions. Yeah. Um, I think at this point, I'm going to ask Rachel, who is has a finger a little bit on the pulse of um, George, maybe you could, you, you, yeah, I'm going to give it to you, Rachel. I'm not going to okay, introduce you. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so I've been lecturing a lot in the last 47 days, 
about the crisis in Ukraine and um, specifically about the hope and resilience of the Jewish women, refugees and children from Ukraine. And I wanted to just start it out by saying hope and resilience in the Jewish community started during the Passover story. So if you're trying to find a tie in to talking about the exodus from Ukraine of 2.5 million people being displaced and the exodus from slavery in Egypt, I have two stories for you to consider and to share at your Seder table. One is, um, as we all know, Miriam left with a timbrel in her hand. So here they are fleeing Egypt and everybody's packing whatever they are packing and she grabs her timbrel. And what I love about this is that she knew there was gonna be time to dance and celebrate on the other side. And my daughter's name is Miriam, so I think about this all the time. I also think about how she's named after my great grandmother who fled Lithuania at the turn of the century. So, um, you know, this is the hope and resilience that they crossed the Red Sea and they were able to sing and dance together and celebrate their freedom because Miriam had packed her timbrel. The other um, example is that the women brought their mirrors and um, there's a beautiful midrash about why did the women bring their mirrors during you know 40 years wandering the desert and the story goes that it was so that they could make themselves more attractive to their husbands to ensure the next generation like you know they didn't want people to lose hope in the desert and think like why are we gonna you know procreate what's the point um but that the women said no we are gonna make this our goal and so they had their mirrors. So anyway, when you're thinking about all of the horrible stories you're watching on CNN or wherever you're watching your news, um, there are just so many stories of struggle. And to Naomi's point tonight about human trafficking, one of the places that the Ukrainians are going is Moldova, which I had not known until recently is the number one country for human trafficking in the world. And all of these Ukrainian refugees are now traveling as women and children into Moldova. So the Jewish Federation is paying particular attention to this situation right now. And I just heard an amazing presentation by Israel, which we're helping to fund to make sure that everybody is safe when they cross the border and they're there um, to, you know, make sure that everybody is being treated well and welcomed properly. And the Moldovan government, the other thing you should know is Moldova is the poorest country in Europe. So not necessarily the first choice country where you wanna live. Um, and so there's a shelter that we've created there. And I have amazing photos that I can share another time of truckloads of toys being brought to Kishinev for the children. One room is being set up as a playroom and one room is being set up as a nursing room for all the young moms to have a safe space for nursing. And um, there are currently 350,000 refugees that have crossed the border just in the last couple of weeks. You can imagine what a burden that would place on our country. And here they are, the poorest country in Europe, taking on that challenge and the government saying, whatever the nonprofits need, we welcome you. We're going to enable you to do the work that you need to do. Um, and people are being welcomed at the border with cups of tea and with a SIM card. And, you know, you're, you're safe here. We're going to keep you safe, thanks to the Jewish community working at the border with Israel. Um, and the other thing that he mentioned is that 80 years ago, the story was completely the opposite. Right, And that's the story that we all know very well, which is the story of the Holocaust, um, that they would have been murdered by the Nazis when they came across the border. And instead, thanks to all of our Jewish partners right now working together with the Ukrainian refugees, everybody's being supported and rescued as they uh, come across the border today. So I just wanted to make sure people knew about the human trafficking in Moldova, and the hope and resilience of our Jewish people that started out even during the Pesach story that we took our timbrels and we took our mirrors and we knew that there would be hope for the future. And I can't tell you when that will be, but I know that we just need to 
stay strong and work together to find a solution. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for all the work that you do. I mean, really, like I think a lot of the presentations um, are expanding out from the traditional Haggadah and saying, you know, like how are we seeing freedom and slavery and trafficking and what's happening in the world, what we're watching, how we're living our lives, the juxtaposition of our lives to what other, like you're just washing your hands in warm water, realize how blessed we are to be able to do that. Um, and and uh, so it's, it, it's hard to hold all of these different emotions together. And now we're entering into this festival of freedom <laughs> and, and, and to have hope that things can be better and to hope to hope that the next generation will inherit a world that we've made better. And, um, and that sometimes we say yes, and then sometimes we say no. And sometimes we know what it is that we can do and we'll do it with our full heart and we'll do it mindfully, but you can't stretch yourself so thin that, you, that you're a schmatter. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a lot of balancing that we do. And um, welcome for anybody else to make any comments. Um, we have a few more minutes um, to close up or anybody wanted to say, uh, Aliza, you look like- you're I am, I'm gonna say something. Right. Um, Rachel, I actually, thank you so much for sharing that. It actually, what it brought to mind was, uh, there's a, a novel, The Third Sister, I think we've read that. And it, I was, I, so I, for anyone who doesn't know, it is a uh, made up, it's a fictionalized story of, a, of what, you, what had happened when Jews were in Russia mm. at, with the pogroms and um, Argent, uh, Jewish Argentinian men were um, taking the women, the Jewish women and bringing them to Argentina and putting them into um, sex houses or whorehouses or, um, and it's an incredible uh, story that nobody, we, that it, it's a real thing that had happened. Um, so my father was born in Argentina and this, and all the Russians were brought over to Argentina and that's where these Jewish women were stuck in these homes. Um, and so it's a, it's an, a, a really painful example of um, some of the slave trade and, and um, that, that I think that's, that feels very similar to what could potentially happen, um, Rachel, that you're sharing. So just for anyone who doesn't know that story, I know it's not a well-known one um, about what had happened to um, Jewish women at that point. Um, uh, I would definitely recommend um, reading it and talking to people about it. Thank you. I mean, and the other, Rachel, thank you. That's amazing. And I think the other amazing thing is that actually JCDS has a, a, a mom and her son and they actually are able, they were able, she had no money to send her child to school um, and they were able to um, like sort of fundraise and, and able to get this little boy a space at JCDS. So it's pretty cool that even locally we're doing stuff um, as well. So, which is pretty cool. So. Any of you, you know, there there are things even locally that are, are happening. And I actually met her on Sunday, and it was. Yeah. Um, is, is this a re is this a Ukrainian refugee that just yes. came in? Is that what yes. you're saying? She just came in with her son. I didn't know there were refugees and in Rhode Island. Oh, she, wow. Yeah, and she he just started school, and um, talking to her is incredibly painful because you can see the pain on her face. Um, you know, as we're all trying to make her life better and, you know, we can't take away what's, what's scary at home um, and the family that she's left behind. Uh, and, and you could really, you can feel the fear. Is, is her, is her partner or husband still? She didn't mention that. She mentioned that um, her grandmother and maybe a cousin or a sister was there with a one-year-old child, but they couldn't get out because the child was too young. Did they come through the JDC? Did they come through the Jewish Federation? I mean, how how do we how do we bring know. how are we bring refugees? Anyway, um, Rachel added something into the chat there. If you'd like to, um, could you explain what that is, Rachel? What that link is. Yeah, it's basically all of the background information about what the Jewish community is doing for Ukraine right now, for refugees right now what's happening with future plans for resettlement that President Biden offered 100,000 spots in the US. So you can go and you can read more about um, advocacy work and um, how to educate yourself about what's going on. So I just was thinking um, from what Rachel was talking about, first of all, I appreciate the 
the positive themes that you brought in. Um, but what also struck me is our tendency to talk about freedom as though it's a wonderful thing, but it can also be terrifying and all our vulnerability. And um, that's, it's not easy. And these are just horrific examples, but to be able to do something to address the vulnerability with safety, with hope, with comfort is so important. So I appreciate that. All right. Any other comments, any other thoughts, any other pre-Passover? Anything's? Otherwise, um, I think what we'll do is we'll say thank you uh, so much to our presenters mm -hmm. for thinking, for first of all, for agreeing, and then for thinking about it so deeply, and then for sharing it so well, and giving us these four snippets, four, four different directions to take a concept of freedom in these different ways in which we can then process for ourselves and what we want to talk about within, within our circles and, and to continue the conversation. Um, and um, and uh, I wish everybody a, a, a good week and a good Passover season. And um, they should all feel hope. And uh, even if we have our timbrels stashed away that we'll soon be dancing together <laughs> in circles with our timbrels and with our mirrors. <laughs> and I'm just uh, gonna say, you... Alyssa, there's a men's scotch night right now. So I'm feeling like a little bit like we missed really? out. Is it in your house? No, no. I think it's at Alison Walter's house. I think she had to leave. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll have a women's scotch night. Or we'll have a women's something. We'll do it. Something. All right, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank really you for pulling this together, Alyssa. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Alyssa. It was great.